Uh, my name is Kimberly Clinch. I'm a Citizen Empowerment Coordinator here at American Promise. A big thank you to everyone who is on the call tonight or listening to the recording afterwards. Either way, you are stepping up to save our democracy, so thank you. Tonight's call is a joint mission serving both as our fourth Lobby Day training call and as our October APA National Conference call. Whether or not you're attending NCLC and Lobby Day, tonight's call is meant to be inspirational for you. We are joined by our very own Jeff Clements, American Promise founder and president, for an update on the progress of our movement. And after Q&A with Jeff, I'm going to go over some NCLC and Lobby Day logistics, and then we'll open it up for Q&A again with both Jeff and I to answer any remaining questions you have um, about Lobby Day from logistics all the way to talking points. Uh, and this information is meant to be helpful for everyone because October's action of the month is to write a letter to the editor sometime next week or beyond informing your neighbors about NCLC and Lobby Day, about the hundreds of citizens who met in D.C. for their annual conference to get big money out of politics and then met with their members of Congress on Capitol Hill about a constitutional amendment to do just that. So even if you are not attending, the parts of tonight's calls that go over Lobby Day will hopefully be helpful uh, for the purposes of your letter to feel like you have a clear understanding of what's going to happen so you feel confident writing about it. Um, before I turn it over to Jeff, I want to start with this quote from Apollo astronaut Rusty Schweikart who said, we aren't passengers on spaceship Earth, we're the crew. We aren't residents on this planet, we're citizens. The difference in both cases is responsibility. We shared this quote ahead of last year's NCLC launch too. Again, we aren't passengers on spaceship Earth, we're the crew. We aren't residents on this planet, we're citizens. The difference in both cases is responsibility. Attending NCLC, meeting with your member of Congress, writing a letter to the editor, these are all examples of you being the crew, of you getting up out of your passenger seats, walking into the cockpit and taking responsibility for the direction of our democratic republic. And it is an honor to be up here with you. And with that, Jeff, it is my pleasure to turn it over to you. I'm just going to take you off mute, and you are live, Jeff, for an update Great. on the progress of our movement. Thank you, Kimberly. Can you hear me okay? Yes, you're coming through the airwaves. Kimberly, this one is good. Oh, good, good, good. I see there's so many people on the call, and hello, everybody, uh, all across the country, um, as Kimberly said, uh, this work and this movement and, and this uh, – this effort of all of us is, uh, is, is something we are all doing together. Like you, I'm a volunteer, and uh, we are deciding to take responsibility to not be consumers or passengers, but citizens in our republic. And it's making a huge difference. Um, what I thought I'd do is just share uh, some uh, background on how far we've come since we started just 36 to 48 months ago, January 2016, and what's coming next. Um, from the beginning, we decided and that this could not be a top-down sort of campaign or just a digital kind of campaign, that the stakes were too high, the work was too big, um, the big permanent reform of a constitutional amendment uh, to reset our democracy on a sure footing and empower people, not big money in our po political system. Um, really required the work of all of us at our local level where we live and then leveraging that work into a strong national network and bringing it to Washington. And that's what's so exciting about the Citizen Lobby Day next week. This strategy never depended on going to Washington with lobbyists in the Capitol and just convince them on the merits that a constitutional amendment or big reform is a good idea. The idea is that we do our work at home, we do the work in the states, we build this powerful movement and then we leverage that on Capitol Hill to get the votes we need to pass a constitutional amendment in the coming few years and get it ratified in 38 states. And so the Citizen Lobby Day and the National Conference are so important, but you will be able to, and as you have been doing so far, do the good work at home. Um, let's step back. Our, what, our, what we do at American Promise is unite and empower all Americans to do this work. And, and both of those words, unite and empower, are critical. As you know, our strategy is, has to be cross-partisan. It has to include everybody who believes, like we do, that America is about equal citizens and human liberty and effective self-government. 
and is willing to work together, even with people you disagree with on pretty important things um, in order to accomplish that much bigger goal of a lasting American Republic. Um, so that's what you are. That's the work you've done. You've tested and proven it. And sometimes when you're in it day to day, it's hard to see what the accomplishment actually is. But uh, just think about it. Just since January 2016, we have added big wins in six different states. Uh, we now have 20 states that have formally called for this constitutional amendment. As you know, the most recent was New Hampshire, which became the 20th state. But we won in California a ballot initiative uh, in 2016. We won in Washington State in 2016. We won in Massachusetts, which created a citizen commission uh, to advance the amendment in 2018, endorsed by the Republican governor, endorsed by progressives like Senator Elizabeth Warren. 72% uh, of the voters passed it. Um, we have won in Nevada. We have won in New Mexico. Uh, we have added, and then, of course, New Hampshire, as I mentioned, six states on the board, 20 states totally, total now. Um, dozens and dozens of cities and towns have passed resolutions now. And all of you in American Promise Associations across the country have put us on the ground uh, in just about every state in the country. And that's huge. Um, what it does is it creates the sustainable state-based work that not only can leverage into votes in Congress, but remember, win a 38-state ratification fight uh, to get the amendment uh, ratified. Our goal when we started was a 10-year game plan, ratify this by July 4th, 2026. If that sounds like a long way off, remember that's only two, uh, possibly three election cycles, and we're well into the first of those three. Uh, so that is literally, uh, well, not literally, but it's right around, right around the corner. And the work we're doing now is so important to getting it there. Um, the other thing that we knew we had to do, um, in addition to winning these state-based campaigns was, um, and building these local American Promise associations, was really driving it uh, to a much bigger scale um, with our communications, with using existing networks, and I wanted to share a couple of things about that. When I say existing networks, what that means is, you know, we're all involved in so many different um, networks, whether we're, um, you know, in, in business um, with our local chambers of commerce or business associations, whether we're in civic groups like Rotaries, um, whether we're farmers uh, and farming organizations and uh, the Farm Bureau or veterans groups. And, our work is supported and um, enthusiastically welcomed by just about every American anywhere. And so we have had great success this year in launching and growing Business for American Promise. You're going to be seeing more of that at the conference. Um, but if you're in a business, uh, if, you, if, you, if you work for a business or have your own business, uh, check it out and contact me or Kimberly to get involved in Business for American Promise. Um, the Rotaries, uh, every town in America practically has a Rotary, and we've been working with some local Rotaries to build up a, a, a program that we can now take to just about any Rotary in the country to spread an, uh, our message. At the conference, Rod Morrison, a third-generation farmer from Wyoming, is going to be there to launch Farmers for American Promise. and. Of course, well, boy, Gatheru, who you know, and, and the Citizen Empowerment Team at American Promise is really excited about building out the Young Americans program. We're going to have 50 uh, to 75 um, young Americans, i.e. between 17 and 22 or so, uh, at the conference, ready to go back and get organized and get working to build this up. So um, all of that is part of the strategy um, that is basically about trusting in each other, um, recognizing that none of us can do it alone and empowering and uniting so that we can build uh, an extraordinary movement. And it's something that's been tested. That's how we got 27 amendments. Um, we're not reinventing, or we're not inventing this for the first time. We're taking the lessons uh, learned that when America was in as much difficulty as we are now and Americans rallied to do big permanent reforms like constitutional amendments so women vote or we elect senators, things like that. Um, we now have tools, technology that can accelerate even faster. And so um, that's what's happening. And so 
on Lobby Day uh, at the National Conference, those of you who are coming, um, we will have, uh, we've been listening and we do, we get feedback and we've adapted. So now we have uh, different messaging and approaches to Democrats and Republicans on Capitol Hill. We've made a lot of gain in, in conversations with Republicans um, on Capitol Hill, but it's a hard thing to ask them to go sign on to a, an amendment that has 150 Democrats signed on to it and one Republican, like John Katko. Uh, but there's no reason why they can't introduce their own amendment, um, their version, and get on board as a matter of principle, and then we'll work to bring them together. And we are just dealing with the realities of partisan Washington um, in order to get those Republicans who want to be with us a way to be with us in an effective way. And if you can't make it to the conference, um, you know, Monday or uh, the Monday after the conference, October uh, 21st, when a, a few hundred of us will be up on Capitol Hill, will be a great day to call your member or drop an email or a letter and say you couldn't make it, but that you're with us in spirit and that when you'd like to get a meeting set up uh, back in the district um, and, and bring the message of our lobby day to your local community. Um, finally, the pledge campaign, 2020 is a big year. Um, we're going to be potentially on the ballot in states like Alaska. We're going to have campaigns in states like Maine to, to build the cross-partisan support for the amendment, even the height of a partisan election. Um, and we have a big candidate pledge program. Many of you got candidates to sign on to the American Promise Pledge in 2018. That was our test run. We had 250 candidates. Well, for 2020, we're going for 1,500 candidates, every office, every party, doesn't matter. They can be asked, do they sign on to the American Promise Pledge to support this constitutional amendment? That program's on the website. Again, um, Kimberly or I would be happy to get that into your hands if you don't have it yet. And um, we are off to a great start. A dozen of the leading presidential candidates have already signed the American Promise Pledge. So, um, a lot's going on. The, the strategy is working after you know, three and a half years in. Uh, we're f much further along than anybody could have guessed. And it's all due to you and your colleagues and, and, uh, and fellow American Promise members around the country. So thank you. And I'll stop there and just uh, answer any questions you have about anything we're doing uh, or suggestions and feedback from you. I'd love to hear it uh, because American Promise in the end is about all of us, and uh, and we are always learning from you, and um, that makes us stronger and our work better. So thank you. Why don't I stop there, and Kimberly can uh, see whose hands are raised and, and field some questions. Absolutely. Thank you, Jeff. Um, yes, if you have a question, um, please, and I'm sure you guys do have a question, please press 1 on your keypad. Awesome. Joan, I see your hand. Um, I, I said that a little bit quickly, so I'll just repeat it. If you have a question for Jeff, press 1 on your keypad, and I'll see that your hand is raised and call on you. Um, you know, if you have any question that's coming to mind, know that someone else now or, or listening to the recording will have the same question. So, um, you know, be be the brave soul and, and press one, and uh, many people will be grateful for you. And with that, Joan, you are off mute. If you could let everyone know where you're calling in from um, and what your question is. Okay, I'm Joan. I'm calling in from Tri-County American Promise in South Jersey. And uh, first I want to say the business initiative can't come soon enough. That's one of the focuses that we're going to be doing here in South Jersey, and we have our first rotary meeting on the 30th of October. But I just sort of have a question as I was preparing for legislative visits and looking at where the um, the various bills that were introduced uh, in the 116th con um, Congress, you know, they, they've been introduced and now they're in committee. So my question is, are there strategies or tactics or messages that we can can or should, is this the right time to try to do things to get these bills heard and get them, you know, so that they're not just sitting in committee. What's the next step? Um, some people, you know, if I'm talking about it at, at cocktail party talk, they'll say, well, you know, nothing's going to happen unless the, there's a big change in the administration. Uh, are there things that we should be thinking about to move those bills that, yes, did get introduced and co-sponsored by people that we helped to convince? What happens to try to move them from sitting in committee? 
Thank you, Joan. Great question, and thanks for all the great work to you and the the team in the Tri County APA. Um, fantastic. So it's a it's a really important question. Um, we don't need any administration. Um, the president doesn't have a role to play in the amendment. Obviously, we'd welcome support from any president uh, uh, along the way, but we need two thirds of Congress to vote this amendment out and get it ratified in 38 states. Um, so. We uh, are fairly confident we'll see a hearing in the House Judiciary Committee. They have some distractions right now, of course, some other, other work they're doing, and they're busy. But, you know, Jamie Raskin uh, is a lead congressman from Maryland. He'll be speaking at the conference. He is a lead sponsor of H.J. Res 2, um, a very solid uh, version of the amendment that's been introduced, as is Jim McGovern, Congressman James McGovern. Uh, both um, leaders on this. Jim McGovern's head of the Rules Committee, a very powerful committee in the House, and Jamie Raskin's on the Judiciary Committee, as is Ted Deutsch, uh, a leader on the amendment from Florida. So um, we think we'll get a hearing uh, in the House. Um, we won't get a hearing this time around in the Senate. Uh, Mitch McConnell is not a, a fan of this. Um, he's the Senate Majority Leader. But, uh, you know, don't buy the, the cocktail party uh sort of resignation, uh, which I know you don't, Joan, because you do so much good work. Uh, but, you know, a lot of people will say, oh, it's going nowhere because of this or that, or, you know, Mitch McConnell's against it, or there's got to be a change. And, and you know, if if they're saying that and it gives them a pass on, on doing the work we need to do, then um, that's unfortunate because the work we do now will determine whether or not we win when the opportunity presents itself. Uh, Mitch McConnell will not be the Senate Majority Leader forever. Um, we are driving to get this amendment voted out of Congress around 2022, 2023. But what we do today matters a lot about whether we'll be ready when the historic window comes. And so specifically to your question, um, if you're meeting with a Democrat on lobby day or back home um, in the House, um, ask for a hearing in the Judiciary Committee. Uh, um, say we, we're ready for it. We welcome the discussion and the debate. Um, and then let's get it up for a vote. Um, we would, uh, when you're talking to Republicans, of course, um, also ask uh, that they, uh, you know, participate in a constructive way in that kind of a hearing of exploring uh, the amendment. But again, I think it's important with a Republican to emphasize uh, that, that if they're with us, that's great. And they, we understand if they don't feel like they're ready to sign on H.J. Res 2 or 48 or some of the other ones that have a lot of Democrats and only one or two Republicans, um, we have a version for them. Uh, we have a statement of principle. We have a, a, a proposed amendment language, which refers to, uh, you know, language that Republicans might like more. Or if they have better language they would like, we're all ears and we'd be happy to work with them. So, um, you know, it would be really a, a big win if the hearings involved, um, you know, debate about which version of the amendment should move forward, uh, because that's a that's the healthy sign rather than a partisan hearing where one side is saying we have a great amendment and, and the other side doesn't isn't really offering anything. So that's what uh, we would suggest is, is ask for hearings and move it ahead and, um, with Democrats, ask Republicans to uh, work with us to introduce an, a version of their own amendment so that they have something to talk about at this hearing besides uh, just no. Um, and on the Senate side, I think, uh, you know, it's a more delicate conversation, uh, but there are many senators on the Republican side we think are sympathetic, and we don't need them necessarily to, you know, buck Mitch McConnell right now, but we would like to know that they're with us, and that's where the statement of principle comes on board. We'd love to get you know, a Senator Collins, a, a Lisa Murkowski, a, you know, Cory Gardner, Ben Sass, or many others who, uh, you know, even, uh, you know, uh, um, Lindsey Graham indicated uh, interest in an amendment. So we think that that's an important conversation. Um, it won't get to a hearing, but in order to find out, are they with us and can we work with them on language that would work for them would be a very important ask, and, and we'd love to know uh, what they tell you. With the Democrats, I think they're all co-sponsoring uh, the Senate version of the amendment introduced by Senator Udall. All the Democrats, independents like Angus King and Bernie Sanders are on board that. And I think discussions about how they can work to bring over some Republicans 
um, would be a useful thing as well. Joan, right. did that, that answer Thank your you. question? Oh, one second. Let me take her off mute so that she can let us know. That helps. I mean, it's it's. Uh, we know it's a long haul, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. No, it is, and and it's uh, it's this is this is how it works. It's um, you know, there's never been an amendment or frankly any big piece of legislation that just sailed through all at once, both houses, without different versions and different debate and. And so, um, you know, we're we're in this for the long haul, but it won't be nearly as long a haul if if we do our job and do our work uh, that it's, that that the opportunities present ourselves uh, themselves to us. So, um, as it will be if 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 we wait till you know it's perfect. And I, that quote that Kim really read uh, just really resonates with me because uh, unfortunately there's nobody else driving the ship but us. So it's really important that we. Um, that we stick to it for the long haul, and I, I know you do, Joan. So thank you so much, and all the all the folks on the call. That um, I'm confident we'll get this we'll get this through. We'll do well in the House this year, um, and we'll be ready in the Senate in the coming, you know, 12 to to 36 months. All right, we've got a uh, number of hands up, so I'll uh, try to call on a few more people. Um, Floyd, you are off mute. If you want to let everyone know where you're calling in from, and uh, what your question is. So this is Floyd, and I don't necessarily have a question. I just have a suggestion of something that has worked well for me in scheduling um, uh, meetings on lobby day. I've told several of the people that I'm meeting with that um, we have a lot of people in Washington who can't afford to travel to D.C. and want to join a conference call. And I've gotten a lot of um, positive feedback about setting up conference calls in the various senator and representatives' offices. That's fantastic, oh, awesome. Floyd. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thanks for doing it, number one. But number two, also for sharing that. Uh, that's what these calls and our, and our whole approach is all about, is sharing what works. So that's a great idea. Indeed. Um, yes, take note. I think about maybe applying that in your state if you're somewhere where you know people who can't afford to make it to D.C. but would like to conference in. Um, Nancy, you are asking if you could let everyone know where you're calling in from and what your question is. Hi, Nancy Morgan from Northern Virginia, and I'd like to thank you, Jeff, for all your inspiration. I think we all think you're so great, and I think that you inspire all of us. Um, my questions are twofold. First, on we've been having conference calls with Vicki Barnes in Minnesota, our group on the language, the H HJR2 versus 48 and the issue of corporate personhood. And, and I'd like to just to make a, to let us know whether during the conference that we're gonna have a discussion about this and in, in terms of best practice on presenting this. And the second one, it comes from the first because our representatives, these are Democrats, and we're trying to get them to sponsor the resolution, and they're going, but Nancy, it's just symbolic. So we've been talking with Vicki and trying to get the language to try to keep, convince Democrats that this, is, that this is important, but they have a feeling that, so what, you'll get 30 states who sign resolutions, but Congress will never take action. Nancy, thank you. Um... Let me just address both of those, but thank you also for your your kind uh, your kind remarks. That's, I much appreciate that, and it was great to see you. For those of you um, in Virginia and Maryland and who were able to be there when the Senate version of the amendment was introduced uh, by Senator Tom Udall, it was on the steps of the Supreme Court uh, just a, a, a few weeks and months ago, and Nancy Morgan was there, uh, and much of the uh, Northern Virginia APA, and it was wonderful to see you. And it was a, it was surely a, a real inspiring day. A big crowd out in front of the Supreme Court as the amendment got introduced in the House and probably ten, or I'm sorry, in the Senate and ten senators speaking. Um, you could see the impact. And I think, you know, that leads me to um, the second question. And I'll come back to the first. The resolutions. Look, without these resolutions, there would not have been ten to twenty senators on the steps of the Supreme Court with a big crowd to introduce a constitutional amendment in the Senate that had already been introduced at a cross-partisan uh, leadership of uh, you know, John Katko joining Ted Deutsch and others in the House and getting 47 co-sponsors. 
um, in the Senate and, almost immediately and 150 in the House. The reason that happened is because 20 states passed resolutions. And so to those Democrats or Republicans, frankly, who say it's just symbolic, you know, I say, well, so is the Declaration of Independence. There was nothing binding about that. It was a declaration. Uh, resolutions are what got almost every amendment we have, including the Bill of Rights. So, you know, the, um, the, the don't don't take no for an answer. If if they just, if, if if the answer is well, it's just symbolic. They well, fine. It's time for some symbolism about what we stand for as a country, and to move this amendment forward. It's been tested before our time, and it's been tested in our time with these 20 states, and we know it works. So we'd like them to get going on it. And I think that would um, be effective because the evidence is overwhelming that um, so-called symbolic resolutions aren't in fact symbolic. They mobilize people, they educate people, it brings the debate forward, and it's building the connected grassroots citizen power that's going to make Congress do this. So that's really important, and um, uh, it's a great question, Nancy, so thank you for asking it. On the conversation you're having with Vicki Barnes and others about what should the amendment and, say, absolutely, it's going to be. Jeff, uh, if, I could, if, yeah. if I could just provide some yeah. context, because I think we have some people on the call who aren't going to be familiar with some of the jargon here. Um, just uh, quickly, so, so Jeff is, is about to introduce, uh, kind of uh, address Nancy's question about, you know, she re referred to HJR2 versus HJR48. And so um, if those do not ring a bell for you, so HJR means House Joint Resolution. Um, and so these are, we're talking about two bills that exist in the United States House that propose constitutional amendments. Um, House Joint Resolution 2, and, and the joint part of it means that it can exist in both the Senate and the House. So House Joint Resolution 2 proposes language that is known as the Democracy for All Amendment. And in fact, it has been introduced in the Senate as SJR or Senate Joint Resolution 51. Um, and HJR 48 is another House bill that proposes um, a different amendment. That language is known as the We the People Amendment. So, um, you know, when we talk about HJR 2 versus HJR 48, um, you know, but kind of the underlying question is, is two different amendment languages, the democracy for all amendment language versus the we the people amendment language. Um, okay, so Jeff, that was just my, my yeah. background and I'll, I'll let you take it away. I appreciate that, Kimberly, and, and, and thanks. It's, uh, we can get in the weeds pretty fast here. So, uh, but, you know, put Indeed. simply, I, I would say, um, you know, we're all working for a constitutional amendment that we need because the Supreme Court says, uh, basically out of uh, a fabricated new theory of what the First Amendment says, that there's an, a, a new right, a right of free speech, so-called, to spend unlimited money to influence the outcome of elections. And it doesn't matter if it's corporation, union, billionaire, unlimited money. It's new and it's radical and it's breaking our, our system and disenfranchising most Americans who don't have the money to have that kind of quote-unquote free speech. And so... The um, different amendment approaches, and there's not just two, the 48 and two, those two resolutions that Kimberly described are, are two of them. But, you know, Joe Biden just announced today he's going he's gonna to introduce an amendment. Uh, he's now the 13th or 14th candidate in the presidential race to pledge to do so. But he, he claims that he wants to outlaw private donations entirely and have public funding of our elections. So this is a really healthy thing. There's a debate about, you know, what should the words say? What should the amendments do? That's right at this stage. One of our strategies, and we were talking about our national strategy, um, includes building consensus, overwhelming national consensus on what the amendment needs to do. And that will be going on and answer your question, Nancy, at the conference. We'll continue our writing the 28th amendment, uh, conversations. We've done town halls all across the country. Some of you have helped host them and organize them in your APAs. Um, we've been uh, in every region of the country engaging thousands of Americans about their hopes and ideas for what the amendment should say. So um, th th it will be part of this and we're confident we'll have a, a really good amendment uh, ready to vote on in these coming months. Uh, but, but um, you know, in the meantime, uh, HJ Res 2, HJ Res 48 are, are both interesting. Uh, one goes a little farther in, on, on corporate rights and um, 
HJRAS2 is a little clearer on the political equality issues, um, and Kimberly would be happy to provide anyone an analysis of the two that our legal team did uh, to give you more background. But bottom line is, um, for those who want to get in the weeds on the amendment language, they can. For those who feel, look, it's, you know, as long as it's doing the job, I just want to help move it forward, you can do that too. Uh, both are really important, and, and we're here to help it happen. So thanks. Thanks, Jeff. And I see we still still have some hands up. Um, we're going to have another Q&A um, later in the call, and Jeff is still going to be on. So what I'm going to do now um, is actually um, to give you some insight into the back end. I'm just going to put everyone's hand down, and, and you'll if you have the same question, come round two of the Q and A. You know, feel free to to press one again and and ask uh, the same question. Um, but uh, just to kind of keep things simple, um, and and I'm I'm moving on because I like I said we are going to have that other round of Q and A, um, and I just want to make sure that um, we've also gotten through talking about the lobby day and NCLC logistics in case uh, we decide that, that that's more um, uh, higher priority questions or, or things we need to cover there. Um, before I get on to, to that, uh, we're going to do our monthly review of progress on key goals. Uh, so first up, public events. In the last month, we reached our goal for the year of 80 public events, and we exceeded it for a total of 89 public events year to date. Nice work. Um, next goal, media pieces. Our goal for the year is 212 media pieces published, and right now we're at 91. Uh, as we've discussed on recent monthly calls, this is an area where we could use some work. Um, obviously, you know, we're looking for 212, and we're um, only at 91, and we're over halfway through the year. Um, so some ideas for increasing our chances of being published. One, have multiple people write about the same topic, and two, um, have everyone submitting their letters to multiple publications. And it's okay if one, you know, basically multiple publications should be receiving multiple letters about the same thing, and that's going to increase the chances that, you know, each publication publishes at least one of your letters. Um, next uh, area that we're tracking, meetings with elected officials. Our goal is to have 200 meetings with elected officials. Right now, we are at 85. Um, this is good progress if we meet our goal of 100 meetings on Lobby Day. Uh, right now, we're only at 53 meetings scheduled. So this leads into my first point of Lobby Day logistics, which is scheduling meetings. If you are a Lobby Day attendee, you have hopefully already heard from me or someone else at American Promise about scheduling Lobby Day meetings and or to connect you with the person from your state who is scheduling Lobby Day meetings. Um, if you aren't a Lobby Day attendee, this is a good thing to know about meetings with elected officials. As a constituent, it is quite likely that you can get a meeting with your congressperson's office. Um, so we've put together instructions with a template message and a script um, to really make that accessible and to empower you to utilize your right to meet with uh, your senator or representative. Um, and, and hopefully, uh, you know, if you're someone who has volunteered to schedule those meetings, um, that you just perhaps have have a few meetings that you haven't um, updated us on, or you know also you know err err on the side of of sending me too many updates. If you're a lobby day attendee and you volunteer to be a scheduler, uh, you know send me an update on what you've heard back. Um, if you haven't heard from me or anyone else about these meetings, you should also reach out to me so I can either put you in touch with the scheduler for your state um, or give you the tools to make the request yourself. Uh, on either of those fronts, you could get in touch with me at Kimberly C at AmericanPromise.net. That's K-I-M-B-E-R-L-Y-C at AmericanPromise.net. Uh, it's not unusual for, uh, you know, someone to call up a member of Congress's DC office, have the phone answered on the second ring, and have a meeting scheduled before you hang up. So we still have time to go from those 53 scheduled meetings to our goal of 100, um, and then be, be well on our way to our go annual goal of, of 200. Um, but yes, definitely need you guys to be up in the drivers, in up in the cockpit driving this ship with us. So um, your help is much appreciated. Uh, all right, now I'm going to walk us through step-by-step step what you need to know for Lobby Day once you get to the conference. Please be thinking of questions you would like to ask as I go through this. Like I said, we'll open up for Q&A again. Um, first, when you arrive at the conference, 
there's going to be a main conference registration table, and right next to that registration table is a lobby day table. Make sure you come to this. When you go to the lobby day table, you will get your own constituent folder, a folder that will help you have a successful lobby day. It will have a laser talk, fact sheet, copies of relevant bills with lists of co-sponsors, a map of Capitol Hill showing you where the different congressional office buildings are, a document laying out our asks, and a meeting best practices document. You'll also get a document with information on the meetings for your state. If you are a scheduler um, or a, a point person, as we have also been calling them, um, you will also get a leave behind folder uh, for each member of Congress on, for whom you are the point person. So it, the leave behind folder um, is just that, a folder that you will leave in the congressional office. Um, it's very, this, is, this step is very important. Please do not forget this one. Um, again, your help is much appreciated. Um, all right, so you've stopped at the lobby day table. You have your lobby day materials, the constituent folder, and the leave behind folder. What's next? Um, Sunday lunch is dedicated to giving you and everyone else who is attending lobby day uh, in your state the chance to sit down together, meet, and over lunch there will be a workshop presentation led by Sam Daly Harris, our very own Azer Cole, and the seasoned Tri-County APA to demonstrate a meeting with a member of Congress or their staff. And then you'll be sitting with everyone from your state. You guys will have time to talk about how you want to divvy up the various talking points and um, to otherwise strategize for your meetings. Then right after lunch, there will be a series of breakouts. And one of those breakouts is going to be, <clears throat> excuse me, is going to be further lobby day training for anyone who's interested. Uh, for instance, if this is your first lobby day, the breakout is a great opportunity to learn and practice good techniques for talking with elected officials. Um, and these skills are not just going to be specific to our lobby day meetings. Uh, you know, perhaps in, in content or example they will be, but um, you know, these, these skills are good long term uh, to know as a citizen of a democracy to be able to have constructive meetings with any of your elected officials, uh, you know, up and down the ballot about any issue. Um, and then I also urge you to talk with your group uh, about meeting Sunday night to practice more together before Monday, the big day. Um, I'm going to go through this, the Monday schedule, but I want to emphasize again um, that, you know, at the conference, the lobby day table is going to be very apparent. Uh, you know, you'll, you'll know to stop by there. You'll pick up your information. Sunday lunch is also going to be very difficult for you to miss. And, you know, both at the table and at the, at, Sunday lunch, um, you know, we're going to go over all this again, um, but right now I'll, I'll just give you a preview. Um, so Monday morning, we're starting off lobby day with a picture in front of the Capitol at 8 a.m. Um, there will be uh, an option to, to go with a group from the uh, Hilton Crystal City to the Capitol steps for a picture there at 8 a.m. And then we are going to march to the Hart Senate office building to deliver New Hampshire's state resolution to their senators and celebrate this latest victory in our movement. That should wrap up by 9.30 a.m., at which point you will all break off with the other attendees from your state and get going on your lobby day meetings. We'll have American Promise staff camped out in the Longworth cafeteria. This is an update to our plan and what I said last month, the new location of our lobby day headquarters is the Longworth cafeteria. Someone from American Promise will be there all day so you can leave items and spend downtime there. Uh, and then when it's time for one of the meetings that you or someone from your state is working to schedule right now, uh, you'll likely head to that meeting together. There might be some breaking up if you have conflicting meetings with different members of Congress, but for the most part, you'll be going to the, those meetings in a group and you'll have an idea of who is leading the different parts of your agenda because you talked about that the day before, Sunday, uh, at lunch and maybe that evening. Um, at the end of each lobby day meeting, one, you should celebrate with your group, including perhaps getting a picture with the person you met. Uh, and two, your group's note taker should follow the instructions listed on the note taking handout, including inputting the information into our online reporting form, um, which is how we'll, we'll know how many lobby day meetings we had uh, when we have our next monthly conference call. Um, our, our tally and our review of that goal will be based on those reporting forms. Um, during lobby day from 12 to 1.30, um, we're having lunch with Massachusetts Congressman Jim McGovern, and then 4.30 to 6 to end lobby day, we're regrouping everyone together to hear from Ben Cohen and enjoy some of his and Jerry's ice cream.
and of course to celebrate. Um, and so that will be the end of Lobby Day, but whether or not you attend NCLC and Lobby Day, next week you can be a crew member of Spaceship Earth by writing a letter to the editor uh, to inform your neighbors about NCL NCLC and Lobby Day. Again, this is a, yeah, a big thing to inform your neighbors about the hundreds of citizens who met in D.C. for their annual conference to get big money out of politics and then met with their members of Congress on Capitol Hill about a constitutional amendment. Um, so in the emails for this call, including the recap email uh, for tomorrow, the monthly action sheet is attached with info for you to use in your letter um, and with directions for submitting it to a local news outlet. Um, and, and with that, I think I have wrapped up uh, start to finish um, the everything coming up in the next uh, week and a half that, that you can do to um, be in the cockpit on, on Spaceship Earth. Uh, and I'll open it up now for Q&A. Um, again, press one on your keypad to raise your hand. Um, and, you know, please, this is our kind of an, an open Q&A session, our last one before Lobby Day, um, before you're writing these letters to the editor. Um, you know, to tell your community about, uh, right, you know, the, our, our annual celebration and, and biggest event in this movement. Um, so, so feel free to ask any questions you have about logistics, um, about progress on our movement, um, talking points when you're in meetings, um, any of that. Uh, all right, uh, Anne Drummis, your hand is up. If you could let everyone know where you're calling in from and what your question is. Thanks, Kimberly. This is Ann from the North Texas APA in Dallas. Um, when I am speaking to groups about the amendment, I am being asked, what would the rules look like if you get the amendment passed? And people are asking me if somebody is working on model legislation that we would be ready to submit in Congress once the amendment is passed. Um, is anybody working on that? Is this something we're either going to talk about at the conference or maybe could have a future conference call about it? Hi, Ann. Uh, Jeff here. Um, thanks for the question and all you do. I look forward to seeing you at the conference. Um, it's a great question and we've been giving it a lot of thought because we, we do have to outline what our vision looks like of success and the amendment is a huge piece of the foundation, but there's so much more that needs to go on onto that foundation to make it to make it really work. And so, uh, you know, the short answer is is that we'll be able to have reasonable limits again. And for most people, that means corporations and unions should just stay out of the elections um, and 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 keep them in the economy where they belong, rather than uh, putting millions of dollars into elections. Uh, we'll be able to do that after the amendment. So uh, those laws were on the books before and um, they're ready to go, and they'll get back on. I think that the big new thing is uh, we'll we need limits on, on people's money, too. Now that, you know, this was pretty unprecedented, but after the Supreme Court, Citizens United, and other decisions, we started having billionaires like, you know, Sheldon Adelson and the Kochs and, and uh, Tom Steyer and others um, literally spending, you know, $100 million on elections. Um, and we're going to have limits on that. It's, it's not going to be okay to dominate uh, the debate like that with just a few people who have hundreds of millions of dollars to spend. And those laws are, are pretty good, too. I think we, we've we had those before. We'll need to apply them on independent expenditures, which um, the Supreme Court has sort of created like a Frankenstein monster. But there's there's good precedents and good ideas and good anti-corruption laws. And I think the, the thing that um, will be interesting and particularly in Texas and other, I know in Alaska and Maine and Wyoming and other places that, um, you know, often think of uh, the states ought to have some say in what they do and they might not all be different. I mean, they might not all be the same. They might in fact be different. So, uh, because I think what we're, the vision is we have plenty of money for campaigns, but it's coming from lots and lots of people in small amounts. So it's not corrupting. And, We've seen there's an energy for that and technology for that, and, and you can raise millions and millions of dollars, uh, you know, 50 bucks at a time now. Um, and that's the kind of vision, I think, that most Americans would like to see. Um, 
to lots of lots of citizens participating with smaller amounts. And in some places that might be tax vouchers. Um, everybody gets a hundred bucks off their tax uh, filing um, income if they contribute it to a campaign and, and uh, an incentive. Other places like, you know, New York and, and Maine had this and Arizona um, would do a sort of public funding match campaign. If you go out and raise a whole bunch of $5 donations, um, you could match and get a public funded um, contribution for your campaign. So lots of people could run for office without owing allegiance to, um, you know, to, to big donors. And, and those systems uh, are already in place and, and could be put in pretty fast. Uh, uh, they're just under tremendous strain and, and not really able to succeed with all the outside money pouring in. So I think, Anne, you're right. We should really be sort of laying out the American Promise uh, model legislation and vision um, as soon as we have the amendment that we will push uh, through uh, and show what that looks like, because I think it would look pretty exciting and, and attractive to most Americans. So let's talk more at the conference, maybe have a call coming up. Um, there's other groups, of course, who have good ideas on that, represent us, and Campaign Legal Center, and um, and many more uh, at the state and federal level, and it may well be a a, a, a program we can start building in over the next 12 months to get sort of the model, including the amendment of what the whole thing looks like. So great question. Thank you. Yes. Um, and, and right, this is a question that I I'll get a lot when I'm um, on the road and um, meeting with, with APAs. And so uh, the thing that um, I found is uh, effective and, and helpful to remind people is that um, you know, that's definitely a good question and, and one that, you know, obviously, you know, people who, who are involved in this work, uh, you know, not surprising that we're all very personally interested in that question. But, you know, any any good system, you know, whether it's a tax deduction or, you know, small dollar donor matching, um, until we have a constitutional amendment, it is always going to be competing with big money and it will probably not win that competition. Um, so you know, kind of uh, that's that's not a question that we, we need to have the answer to um, in order to, you know, be motivated and know that this work also needs to happen. Um, for, you know, my, my, my two cents of, of what's worked um, in my experience. Um, Ashwari, you, I see your hand is raised, so I have taken you one second. My computer will work with me. I'll take you off mute. One moment. Sorry, Ashray. Ashray, you are off mute. If you could let everyone know um, where you're calling in from and what your question is. Thank you. So I'm calling in from Santa Fe, New Mexico. My question has to do with something, Jeff, that you talked about a minute ago. I'm sitting in a dark car. <laughs> so I'm, I can't read my notes, but you talked about a um, statement of um, principle. Is, is that is that like a thing? Um, yeah, thanks, Ashwari. Yes, how are you? Um, it is a thing now. Uh, so the statement of principle I mentioned, um, you'll see in the lobby packs, and we'll begin rolling it out to the APAs after the lobby day. And we've adapted it from the success we've had with Business for American Promise, Farmers for American Promise, um, veterans, um, and conversations with Republicans where they may be a little newer to it than all of us on the call or some of us on the call, and they're not quite sure exactly what the amendment should say, but they know they want reasonable limits on the money in the system. They think we the people ought to be able to make those, those rules and those decisions about the role of money in, in our political system and, and combat the corruption, and they're for an amendment. And we want to give a way for um, people in, in different groups and networks to sign on together to, so that they can begin identifying each other and working with each other in these sort of peer-to-peer -peer networks, um, like, you know, Republicans on Capitol Hill, where, you know, it's just, again, too big an ask to say, go sign on to H.J. Reds 2, an amendment with 150 Democrats on it and one Republican. Uh, but, you know, they're ready to sign a statement of principle. That would be a big thing to know who among the Republicans is, is with us in principle and we can begin working with on specifics. 
Same thing for business people and veterans and many, many others. So we're using statements of principle, which are, um, you, if you, you can see it on the Business for American Promise website. Um, they're not that different, but they're uh, sort of general statements that um, the vision that we believe in in America is, is, is that um, representatives ought to be accountable to the people, that the people ought to be represented, not big donors, the people and constituents um, in the state and in the districts ought to be represented and have the most voice, not donors and uh, out of the state, things like that. And uh, and we find it's a pretty useful tool. Um, so that's what, that's what I meant by the statement of principle. Does that make sense, Ashwari? Something we could use kind of as a fall fallback for people who are like, you know, they don't sign pledges or they aren't ready to sign the pledge, like candidates and elected officials, would it make sense to say, well, you know, then once you've had the whole conversation and you've determined they really aren't going to pledge, then would this be the next level that they could actually express their support without pledging? Yeah, sure, it could be. I think, you know, we tried to word the pledge pretty carefully, too, to be uh -huh. something like a statement of principle where it really doesn't mm -hmm. require a pledge to vote for a specific amendment. So, yeah. uh, you know, so that might not be needed as much. Um, someone who didn't want to sign the pledge might not sign such a statement of principle either, but that's worth a try. Let us know if, uh -huh. if you find yeah. that. But we find it um, more for the, not for the political people, but for people who are just beginning to learn about our work and they may be, you know, business uh -huh. people talking with different business people or, people in the rotary, okay. you know, civic groups talking to each other uh -huh. or, you know, veterans taking, you know, going down to the, um, you know, to the Legion Hall with an idea, hey, you know, there's this amendment and how do these principles sound to you? And it's a good way to have the conversation rather than diving into the weeds of, you know, HJ Res 2 or SJ Res whatever, HJ Res uh -huh. 48. It's a conversation about shared principles of Americans that leads uh -huh. to you know, hey, yeah, we need this amendment. And so we found it to be mm -hmm. pretty good for that kind of peer-to-peer -peer network conversation and helping people to rally to the amendment cause um, in principle Great. and then as a step in. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'd like to learn more about yeah. that. So, um, yeah, that's great. great. Thank you. Sure. Kimberly, All right. If anyone there? else, right. yes, I am. I am. I was just uh, was taking taking myself off mute. Um, if anyone else has a question, uh, press press one on your keypad, and I'll I'll call on you. And, and while we're waiting for um, everyone to to find their their one button, um, a question that that I've been getting in talking with people, um, or you know, kind of uh, that I an experience I've been hearing about is, you know, people reaching out to Democrats who, you know, offices of, of Democratic members of Congress who are saying, um, you know, the, the representative or the senator is, is already a co-sponsor. Um, or perhaps our, our volunteers are already, you know, saying, well, my, my representative or my senator is, is already a co-sponsor. You know, they're, um, what, what more can I ask of them? Um, what's your, what's your response to that? And, um, you know, I, I have an inkling, but I think it'll be it'll be good to hear it from you, Jeff. Well, I think um, your inkling is probably <laughs> similar. Um, I think our citizen empowerment team has talked a lot about the sort of champion scale and, and moving people from, okay, you, you're for it, well, now you're co-sponsor. Well, great, you're co-sponsoring, but are you talking it up when you go back home to the district? Are you talking to others? Are you raising the amendment where, you know, wherever you go, are you working to try to solve the cross-partisan problem and not, not just using it as sort of partisan advantage that you're for the amendment and the other side isn't, but you're actually, you know, talking to the Problem Solvers Caucus, for example, that has 24 Republicans and 24 Democrats committed to working together to solve problems, maybe, you know, ask for an opportunity to present why they should get behind the amendment. Uh, that would be really something to help uh, you know, get a, uh, the Problem Solvers Caucus behind this. And so I think a conversation um, that, of course, starts with, hey, huge thanks for co-sponsoring the amendment. It's wonderful. It's great. 
uh, we don't want to take that for granted. Uh, we want to express our appreciation, but then say, okay, now we know we need 290 votes in the House, 67 in the Senate, and then get it ratified in 38 states. What else can we do? And your, your member of Congress or your elected official might well welcome that chance to brainstorm. Hey, why don't I, why don't I bring it up at uh, my talk this week with the local chamber of commerce? And you can say, well, that's great. We've got some business people, business for American promise. We're happy to give you some talking points. And if you need help with that or finding that, just check in with, with Kimberly and she'll um, steer you to our business for American promise team or, might be somebody who says, hey, I'm going to speak at the Veterans Hall, a congressman, or a, um, speak with the Farm Bureau. Uh, do you have anything that could make the amendment relevant to them? And, and, well, we do. So that kind of conversation can move people along the champion scale and really help amplify uh, the amendment so that they become, um, yes, the co-sponsor, great. Now become a champion of the movement and, and help get it through and out of Congress. So there's some ideas I'd welcome others um, who've had those conversations and have found have found things that worked well. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, and, you know, along that vein, um, would like to remind all of you that um, you can also be, be champions. You are also on the champion scale. It's not just our elected officials. Um, again, uh, we're we're not passengers on on spaceship Earth. We're the crew. Uh, every every one of us, whether we're we're in elected office or not. Um, so, right, you know, as a as a sign of my my respect for you, I, I ask you the question: are, are you know where are you on the champion scale? Are you, um, you know, spreading this movement? Are you kind of a, a node of the network? You know, branching out and and bringing in more nodes. Um, again, as, as many of you have probably heard, we, we often talk about this um, study that was done by Lawrence Lessig's organization in 2015, and they found that 96% of Americans want big money out of politics, and 91% don't think it's possible. Now, that was in 2015, so my hope is that um, today that, that number is lower, but still, I'm sure you guys have the experience that I do that you know, many of the people I first tell about American Promise um, are, are not aware that there is this movement for a constitutional amendment to get big money out of politics. Um, and, you know, just telling people that changes the calculus of is it possible? Because um, I think if, you know, if you're on this call, you know that it, it totally is possible. Um, and, and we just need to, to start filling in uh, all the other Americans uh, on the good news. Um, so, you know, I encourage you this week with the conference coming up, it's a great opportunity to bring it up with people. If you're attending, you know, are, are you telling the people at your office, are you telling your friends, uh, you know, the ones who aren't involved in American Promise, hey, I'm going to D.C. this weekend for this conference about a constitutional, you know, about the constitutional amendment that will get big money out of politics. Um, and if you aren't, you know, are you are you telling people, you know, still as, as a news item, you know, take a, take a break from from the headlines and the, you know, oh, did you see this tweet? You know, hey, did you hear there's a, a conference in DC this weekend about the constitutional amendment to get big money out of politics? Um, you know, uh, I've have, I, yeah, have a lot of great conversations and um, encourage you guys all to, um, you know, take advantage of, of NCLC even as, as a talking point. Um, and then again, um, you know, this weekend to enjoy it if you're attending and, and next week, um, to to write a letter to the editor about it, um, and uh, you know this this call rounded out our uh, series of, of lobby day training calls. Uh, tomorrow, a recording of the call will be available alongside our first three lobby day training calls. In our first call, we heard from Sam Daly Harris, who offered us motivation for attending lobby day and ideas for getting others involved, much like Floyd did, uh, conference calling people in. Um, in call two, Congressional Scheduler Alex Roca and AP Leader Marie Henselder Kimmel offered tips for planning a successful lobby day. Did someone say comfortable shoes? Um, and in call three, we heard from David Burke, President of Citizens Take Action, an experienced citizen lobbyist about talking points and tips for conducting meetings with our members of Congress. 